Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Musical Inner Tube. I'm Don Rooney. And I'm John Tim Payne. You know, Don's had quite a career in radio and television, where he's been an air personality, a news anchor, even a TV weatherman. And John has been a college professor. He's written several books, and he's been an editor and features writer at the Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper. We first teamed up for a radio show in college. On one show, we introduced a soothing musical interlude. But we stumbled, and it came out musical inner two. And that became the name for this podcast, where we talk with interesting people about their interesting lives, difference makers who really make a difference. Paul Offit is director of the Vaccine Education Center and professor of pediatrics in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He is also the Maurice R. Hilleman Professor of Vaccinology at the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's an internationally recognized expert in the fields of virology and immunology. He was a member of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And he's a member of the FDA Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, and it's a very great pleasure to have him and his expertise again on this podcast. Welcome again, Paul. Thanks, John. It's my pleasure. Could we begin by having you scan the current COVID scene and telling us what it looks like to you? Uh, Where are we now and how did we get here? What's it look like? So, um, largely good news. Uh, It's this virus, SARS-CoV-2 virus, was isolated and sequenced in January 2020. And in only 11 months, we were able to, using a novel technology, messenger RNA, perform two large clinical trials, one by Pfizer, one by Moderna, to show that the vaccine was highly effective and safe. 11 months, fastest vaccine ever made. Then the Biden administration did the next hard part, which they figured out how to mass produce this vaccine, which was not easy. This is a lipid nanoparticle encapsulated uh, um, piece of mRNA that had never been scaled up before. And that's often the hard part when it comes to vaccines is scaling them up. So figured out how to mass produce, mass distribute, mass administer a vaccine in a public health system that did not have such a thing for adults. We didn't really have any sort of uh, plan in place to mass vaccinating adults before. Did that. Then, you know, March, April, you know, million doses a day, two million doses a day, three million doses a day in 2021, four million doses a day. And then by May, we hit a wall. And there was roughly one third of the population that simply was not going to be vaccinated. Um, it was a political thing. They just were not going to get vaccinated. It wasn't a knowledge gap problem. It wasn't an access problem. They just didn't want to get vaccinated. Now, in order for us to get on top of this pandemic, we need a high level of population immunity, probably in the mid 90% range. Now, it, natural infection counts as being immune. If you're, if you're naturally infected, you, you dramatically decrease your chance of having serious illness upon re-exposure. So we're probably at about 90% population immunity now in terms of protection against serious illness. Um, so I think that, that you'll definitely see the numbers come down as we hit spring, summer, early fall, and then next winter, because this is at its heart a winter virus, coronaviruses are winter viruses. We will probably see again a bump next winter that is not as big as this winter. And I think we will move from pandemic to endemic, meaning I think gradually as we move to the summer, people are just not going to let this virus change the way they live anymore. That's an amazing story on so many levels, uh, and there's so many questions that one could ask about it. And of course, we're aware of this. I think we're seeing people. Uh, some of it is wishful thinking, but a lot of it is responding to the way things really are. are they're going out more. They're they're wearing masks less. Um, uh, so let me ask you uh, one of them, a number of questions that comes out of uh, this overview you've just given us. First of all, could you explain for our listeners? Uh, why coronaviruses are, as you say, winter viruses? No idea. You would think I would know. I mean, there, you know, polio viruses is, is an intestinal virus. It's a summer virus. Rotaviruses are all another intestinal virus. It's very similar to polio virus. It's a winter virus. Um, when rotavirus comes into this country every year, it sort of generally started on the west coast and then would sweep across to the east coast. Um, I have no idea why those things happen. You think I would? We always say that, you know, in the winter, people are crowded together and stuff, but um, I, I really don't know. That's that's so interesting. And of course, it, it underlines the fact that as great as the advances have been, and in the last few years, as you've said, you know, literally, 
uh, you know, the human race and, and the United States as a subset of that have actually done things that have never been done before, not on this scale, not ever. <laughs> and, uh, and, and yet there are a lot of things that we don't know about this critter, right? You know, and uh, if we did, it probably would be nice. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's an unusual virus. It, it, it's it's uh, and people have uh, falsely uh, compared it to influenza. It's not influenza. What, what this virus does that influenza doesn't do is it causes you to make an immune response to the cells that line your blood vessels. So it can cause strokes and heart attacks. I mean, this this so called uh, post infectious inflammatory disease of children, which is called Miss C, which also has its counterpart in adults, you know, can present with a child who's completely um, uh, recovers from their initial infection, usually, you know, average of about nine years of age, but anywhere between five and 13. And then, you know, presents with not just lung disease, but also heart disease, liver disease, kidney disease. And they can be quite sick. I, that, I don't know of any other virus that does that. Yeah. We're starting to hear a lot more now about uh, people with long COVID, people who got the disease and then aren't able to shake off the symptoms for, for years afterwards. Yeah, and I think that's probably more than one thing. I, I think it, it certainly at, it's at least is probably represents some vascular damage that, you know, to areas like the brain or heart or, or liver or kidney. I, th I think that's part of it. I think there's probably a psychological component to being very sick for a long time. And, and it would be nice when we study long COVID to compare it to people who also were significantly ill with influenza to see what are the differences. Um, but yeah, I think we're learning about long COVID and it, uh, it's, uh, again, something different uh, as compared to other viral infections. Yeah. When you said earlier that it wasn't like the flu, uh, that, that gets me thinking about all those people that have said uh, that it would be like the flu and that would become endemic and we would get uh, shots for COVID every year the way we get shots for flu. I is that an idea that, that you can live with? Well, so we give, an, we give an influenza vaccine every year because even if you've been naturally infected or vaccinated the previous year, you still are susceptible to serious illness. That's why we give a yearly flu vaccine because that virus mutates so much from one year to the next that you're not protected the following year. That doesn't appear to be true with this virus. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, the vaccines that were made were made against the original strain, the so-called Wuhan strain or ancestral strain, which was not the virus that left China. The virus that left China was the first variant, the so-called D614G variant, which was replaced by the Alpha variant, which was replaced by the Delta variant, which was replaced by the Omicron variant, because each one was more contagious. For the most part, um, that original vaccine still protects against serious illness, and, and probably for a while, I would think for years, but again, we'll see. Omicron was different in that it was immune evasive, in that, that even if you'd been vaccinated, you weren't well protected against mild illness. And so that's why it spread to the degree it spread, because you had now a whole other group of people who were susceptible, which is people who were vaccinated. Um, that's Omicron. But unless this virus mutates to the point that that vaccination does not protect against serious illness, I don't really see why we would have a yearly vaccine. But again, uh, this virus continues to surprise, so we'll see. I was wondering, too, about the political element uh, of this. Um, it, it has several facets to it, but let's let's take the most. Uh, I think the, the the one that had the most impact in the story that you began our podcast with, that is the refusal to be vaccinated or or not to comply and not to get the second shot or maybe not to get the third shot. You know, just the, the skepticism. Um, I guess that's never going to change. That's always going to be there for about a third of the population. You know, it's it's interesting. There was never a politics of the anti-vaccine movement. I've been at least looking at the anti-vaccine movement for, you know, 30 years. I mean, starting, starting from like the early 1980s, which I think was the birth of the modern American anti-vaccine movement with the false notion that the pertussis or whooping cough vaccine caused permanent brain damage. That was really the birth of this. It was really 40 years ago. And it was actually April 19th, 1982 was when that notion was born. Um, and, and, and so on the, it, on the left, it was, you know, sort of the all things natural. I don't want to be injected with anything that has a chemical name. On the right, it was what you're seeing now, which is this libertarian government off my back. Don't tell me what to do. I think the anti-vaccine movement, if anything, was more sort of to the left. You looked at that 2014, 2015 measles outbreak that started in Southern California in a heavily democratic area, spread to 25 states, affected about 200 people, um, that led to ultimately California uh, introducing a bill that eliminated 
dedicated to philosophical exams. And I would say at that point, that's where they were. Um, and, and largely, they had been tuned out because they kept sounding the same one-note song, which is vaccines cause autism, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, hyperactivity, whatever. And study after study had shown that was wrong. And so the mainstream media, I think, had largely turned away from them until this pandemic, because I think what they learned was to, to link themselves to the right, because that, that when they changed the message, which was occurred really right before this pandemic, to, you know, bodily autonomy, um, individual freedoms, personal liberty, uh, don't tell me what to do, that resonated with what was this feeling on the right that we shouldn't mandate anything. And then they got a lot more money, got a lot more of, of a a place at the table and and therefore have been enormously impactful. You, you said earlier that getting the disease imparts some immunity. Does it impart the same kind of immunity that you would get if you got the vaccines? I think for the most part, yes. If you're a healthy person and you you have a, a, you know moderate illness, for example, um, the studies from the CDC looking at vaccinated people versus unvaccinated people versus people who were only naturally infected but not vaccinated at all, there's really not much difference between the vaccinated person and the um, the person who's been naturally infected in terms of prevention against serious illness. So yeah, I, I don't think that, which is what you'd expect. I mean, that's true for other similar viruses. The respiratory syncytial virus, natural infection, protects against serious illness associated with re-exposure. It's also true with rotaviruses, other mucosal similar viruses in terms of the le- the incubation period, length of time from when you're first exposed to when you get disease. So I, I don't think it's at all surprising that natural infection protects that. that those are the CDC's data. So if we combine people who have had their their shots and their boosters and people who have had COVID and then come out the other side, uh, combining those numbers, do we have now a possibility of having like uh, two-thirds of the American population immune to COVID now? Well, I think we're that if you if you compare if you add people who've either been naturally infected or vaccinated or the combination, I think we're probably at ninety percent population immunity now. The problem is it's not equally spread across the country. Um, there are pockets of people who who are not vaccinated and haven't been naturally infected yet. And so when you see these outbreaks occurring, that's generally where they occur. When you see people dying, that's generally where it occurs. I mean, there's I know you've probably seen. This study is done looking at sort of um, sort of heavily uh, red counties versus heavily blue counties, and you can see that you know you're much more likely to die if you live in a heavily, um, say, uh, Trump supported area than in a Biden supported area. Um, does this mean so? So if ninety percent of us are are uh, immune to some degree, uh, but that 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 distribution is lumpy and uh, it's region specific, right? There's, there's areas where it's not true. Uh, I know a lot of people are going to hear that and say, oh, well, then we're, even though they're not going to hear the part about parts of the area, uh, parts of the country still being a place where people die, which it is true. Um, a lot of people are going to hear that and say, oh, so we're at herd immunity. And what, you know, what is it? But we're, is that true? Are we there? Um, I think we're getting there. Uh, by, by herd immunity, what I mean is is a significant slowing in the instance of of um, serious illness, meaning hospitalization, ICU admission, death. I think as we head into spring and summer, I, I think we're going to be have fewer than five hundred deaths a day maybe fewer than 300 deaths a day. And then then I'll tell you whether or not we're we're there, where we we are where we need to be when you head into late 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 fall early winter next year. Then we'll see um where we are. I I'm sure there'll be a bump. I I think it will be a much lower bump than what we're seeing now. But if it's high, if it's just like what we're seeing now then no, we're not there. So we're we're looking uh, the bump's going to come in September, do you think? That's right. So, so mm-hmm. September, October. Yeah. September, October. Interesting. Really interesting. So I've I've been reading a lot of articles recently about the number of COVID deaths. Like we're approaching or or we're over a million COVID deaths in the United States through the pandemic. And and a lot of these articles are saying that it's a shame, really, that that people aren't paying more attention to it, that they're not more aggrieved by it, that they all want to throw off their masks and go back to normal. And I'm wondering, is that a way of coping with the problem that we that we have that with the total number of people that have died from the disease? 
Right. It's, I mean, if you look at, for example, the 1918-1919 pandemic, that, was, that went on beyond 1919. I mean, there were a few years after that where you'd still see these winter surges, but people didn't consider that a pandemic anymore, and they went about their normal lives. If you look two years before this pandemic hit our country, influenza caused 800,000 hospitalizations and 60,000 deaths. The year before the pandemic hit this country, it caused 500,000 hospitalizations and 36,000 deaths. I mean, you know, when I go to a Philadelphia Eagles game, uh, in in December, um, you know, and I'm standing around, you know, thousands of people screaming and booing. Um, I probably would do well to wear a mask. I mean, I'm over 65, and even though I've been vaccinated, vaccines aren't 100 percent effective. Certainly not the flu vaccine, but I don't do that. I don't protect myself. I sort of grandfathered that in, um, as we as I think we're going to do with this virus too. We'll have more with Paul in a moment, but first, this soothing musical inner tube. Paul A. Offit is one of the most recognizable communicators in the field of virology and vaccinology. Paul was a member of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and he is a member of the FDA Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee. Among his books are Autism's False Prophets, Bad Science, Risky Medicine, and the Search for a Cure, Bad Faith, when religious belief undermines modern medicine, bad advice, or why celebrities, politicians, and activists aren't your best source of health information, and you bet your life from blood transfusions to mass vaccination. For more, you can check out his author page at paul-offit.com. Offit is spelled O-F-F-I-T. And now, back to the musical inner tube, already in progress. So, what uh, can you tell me? How does um, in in terms of daily life, in terms of the daily life of our society, how does an endemic uh, look as opposed to a pandemic? What's different about how an endemic looks? Can you talk about that? The, the population defines that. The people define what's endemic. And so you would think it's sort of a solid black line when you cross from X number of cases or X number of hospitalizations or X number of deaths per, per day. That's not it. It's what we feel comfortable with. And and we'll see. The public will define what an endemic is. But one would accept that they probably act more freely, um, that, you know, uh, go out more. I mean, masks go, uh, go away. In other words, there'll be large numbers of people who change their behaviors. That's right. I think people will test the water initially with one foot. They'll go out there, see what it's like to, to not wear a mask at places where they previously had done that. Then they'll do that more and more, and we'll we'll see where we are. I don't know what those numbers are. There will be a certain number where I think most people will then feel comfortable in terms of cases and hospitalizations and deaths. I don't know what that number is. And this virus is hard to predict. I mean, it may... I think what the CDC should do as as they back off mask mandates, back off vaccine mandates, is make it clear what those numbers will look like if we need to go back. Meaning if, if they once again really try and push for restrictions, push more for, for va- you know, saying showing your vaccine card, et cetera, they should make it clear what those numbers are now so that uh, we're not surprised. And one of my favorite lines recently about COVID was from Saturday Night Live the other night where they said, because New York is backing off of the uh, the restrictions, uh, one of the guys said, uh, New York restaurants will no longer pretend to look at your COVID <laughs> vaccination card. So with your background in pediatrics, Paul, I, I was wondering uh, what the stand is on kids and masks and that sort of thing, because that's been a big, big factor in uh, cities across the country for for months and months and months about whether or not to mask kids when they go to school. I think kids have really suffered this uh, for, from from the standpoint of not being able to go to school. I mean, distance learning to me is a contradiction in terms of that loss of socialization that children have at, or when they're in school and they're masking in everybody's masks and you can't see the expressions of the person you're talking to. I think it's been very isolating. If you if you look at children in a cafeteria, for example, in a school that's really trying to social distance, you, know, you see these children sitting alone, eating by themselves. It, it's awful. Um, I, I think children have suffered this as much as anybody. Now, when the virus first came into the country, the mantra, and it was correct, was children get infected less frequently. And when they're infected, they're infected less severely. That's true. But that has changed. From when the virus first came in, they, children accounted for about 3% of cases. Now it's more like 27% of cases. Um, 
But but children, you know, that's why we have vaccines for children. I mean, vac- children do, can suffer this disease uh, severely, and they can don't necessarily have to have a comorbidity in order to suffer this disease severely. I mean, when I was on service back in December, you know, when we were seeing a lot of cases, we admitted 18 children into the hospital with COVID. Um, all but one was over five. None of them were vaccinated, even though all of them could have been because the vaccine had been available since the beginning of November for the over five-year-old and, and since May for the over 12-year-old. Um, and, you know, the children weren't vaccinated, the parents weren't vaccinated, the siblings weren't vaccinated. And you're watching these kids, five of whom were brought up to the intensive care unit and ventilated. Um, and it was all preventable. It's it's hard to watch. So um, we are seeing some things uh, nationally. Uh, you know, uh, the, the virus does keep making headlines of a sort. Uh, it has been decided in Florida, for example, not to vaccinate healthy children. And uh, I'm wondering if you could comment on that decision. Right. So when, when, when the, the FDA's vaccine advisory committee, our committee was presented with data about, say, the five to 11 year old child, which was presented to us on October 26th. So it was really before we hit, you know, sort of major winter admissions. Um, we learned then that about 8,600 children had been hospitalized in that five to 11 year old age group. We learned then that about 66 children had died, which meant that virus then put the deaths in the top 10 reasons for death in children that age group. And we knew that one third of those children who were hospitalized were previously normal, which is to say they had no com- comorbidity. So the notion that was raised by this Florida uh, state um, uh, um, um, surgeon general that um, that healthy children don't need to be vaccinated belies the data. I don't know why he said that. Um, he should round in a hospital and see what it's like in the winter months so he can know what it's like to watch children suffer needlessly. Oh boy, that, that's another problem we have is healthcare workers. Uh, they've been they've been through a war for the last couple of years with this uh, pandemic, and, and we've heard so many doctors and nurses talk about uh, the helplessness they felt. Uh, watching patients come in and patients die. That, that's something that we really have to work on is, is working on the psyche of, of healthcare workers. Yeah, it's been really hard. Uh, I mean, you know, my division has maybe 30 people in it total. And we just always would meet as a group, whether we would have, you know, clinical infectious disease meetings or journal clubs or whatever, we would always meet as a group. That doesn't happen anymore. We meet by Zoom. And and that has worn us down. I mean, I think there's a lot more um, just uh, dissonance uh, among people just in our group because we just don't get to see each other anymore. And, and so many things get calmed down when you can just see each other in person and talk in person. And um, it's been really hard. I, I um, You can see it in the hospital. People are really worn down by this virus. I'm wondering about uh, one of the aspects of, of the development of these vaccines, which has been much remarked on, um, I don't want to say the rules were broken, but they were so, sort of bent a little bit so that we could hurry up the development of these um, uh, uh, the uh, the vaccines. And one can understand that because there was a huge uh, emergency uh, need for it. I'm wondering if anybody uh, at the FDA is is thinking about revising the FDA's uh, standards for how drugs are developed and tested. Well, so so I'll tell you what was similar and what was different. Um, what was similar about these two vaccine trials, so December 10th, December 17th of 2020, our committee, FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee, was presented first with Pfizer's 40,000-person trial and, and then Moderna's 30,000-person trial. Those, those size of those trials as a so-called phase three prospective placebo-controlled efficacy safety trial were the size of any typical adult or pediatric vaccine. So that wasn't different. The safety follow-up was also similar, which is to say two months after the last dose. So that was no different. The difference was length of time looking for efficacy. Those were three-month studies, essentially. So most of those people had gotten a second dose recently. So therefore, the efficacy, even against mild disease, was 95%. There's no way that was going to hold up over time. And I think we could have done a much better job, actually, it's a little off the point, but I think we could have done a much better job of explaining that to people. That that um, that um Because I think the biggest communications error, frankly, with this vaccine um, occurred with an outbreak that, that, that happened in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Thousands of men get together um, to celebrate the holiday. 79% are vaccinated. About 350 get 
uh, COVID who had been vaccinated. Uh, only four were hospitalized, meaning a hospitalization rate of 1.2%, which is excellent. And um, the other cases, asymptomatic and mild cases, were called breakthrough illnesses. Bad term. I mean, first of all, those, those, those men, one, got a vaccine, exposed to the virus, had a mild illness. That's all you can expect from a vaccine is to protect you against serious illness. And the minute we use the term breakthrough and basically created this kind of zero tolerance strategy for this virus, I think that's going to be the hardest thing to get over. We're going to have to get over it because we can't boost people three times a year to try and keep the neutralizing antibodies up to prevent mild illness. That's not going to happen. That is not a public health strategy. So the only way we're going to be able to move forward from pandemic to endemic is to get people to realize that we have to accept some level of mild illness in this uh, for this disease. If I could put that in slightly different terms, Paul, um, getting mildly ill is actually one of the benefits of a vaccine, right? That it, it prevents anything worse, uh, you know, that you might, if just exposed to it without any protection, get much sicker. And, and so the notion of a breakthrough illness uh, is, is sort of, it's, it's not a lie so much as it, it's a, a, mis, a, a misnomer since what a vaccine does is to boost your immune system. So you might still get a little sick, you're, you'll be you'll be protected from serious illness or death at a much higher rate. Am I getting that right? Right. The term breakthrough implies failure. That that's not a failure. That's what you want. If you get an influenza vaccine and you have a mild illness, especially if you're an older person, know that you were just protected from having a more severe disease that kills tens of thousands of people a year in this country. And and I think, I mean, so for example, when Lindsey Graham was infected, I remember when this this happened. Um, he was fully vaccinated. I mean, he had had two doses of an mRNA containing vaccine. He had a mild upper respiratory tract infection with sinusitis, the inflammation of the sinuses, and said correctly quote, this would have been much worse if I hadn't been vaccinated. That's exactly right. He got it right. But if you watch the way this was covered in the news, I mean, when Brett Kavanaugh had an asymptomatic infection, if you watch the way that was covered on the news, you would have thought he was in the intensive care unit. I, we just, we're not good about this. And, and getting back to what John had said earlier, do you think that there were some people that distrusted the vaccine because of the speed with which it was deployed, thinking that maybe we were taking some shortcuts to get it out to people? Yes, definitely. Although the only there was no there were no shortcuts. Uh, and really, in terms of manufacturing supervision, in terms of size of the trials, in terms of safety follow up, that was all the same. The only difference really was that, you know, if you looked at, for example, the rotavirus vaccine trials, those were four year trials. The human papillomavirus vaccine trials were seven year trials. These were three month trials. So that was it. The safety, the the efficacy was really what you wondered about, and because you knew that 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 ninety five percent protection against mild illness was not going to hold up, because that's based. On neutralizing antibodies and neutralizing antibodies fade. On the other hand, protection against serious illness is based on memory cells, memory T cells, memory B cells, and those are generally long lived. So this, this, the protection against serious illness is held up for certainly for healthy young people. Mm-hmm. And I, I do think we could have explained that better. And, and frankly, when President Biden stood up on August 18th and without consulting the FDA and without consulting the CDC said, as of September 20th, he said, I am going to, our administration is going to offer a booster dose for everybody over 16 years of age. Thus, he sent the message that two doses wasn't enough. And people were confused as to what it meant to be fully vaccinated. I think they're still confused about what it means to be fully vaccinated. Yeah, I, I realize that. The advice from the White House and the CDC changed uh, over time, in part because of where the science was taking them. But still, do do you think that uh, the overall impression of that was that there were people in both those institutions that were just wishy-washy people that were coming up with this answer and that answer and throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what would stick? Well, I think it, it was. It, I don't think they were wishy washy people throwing against, things against the wall to see whether it was sick. I think what they were was people who were trying to make decisions on the fly without all the, the data you necessarily need to make that decision, realizing that those data may become available later. I mean, we, for example, um, we, the Vaccine Advisory Committee on February 26th, uh, approved the use of Johnson Johnson's vaccine, which was a vectored virus vaccine, so not an mRNA vaccine. <clears throat> later, we found that. It was a very rare cause of something called thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, which is a very long way of saying blood clots, including blood clots in the brain, including potentially fatal blood clots in the brain. And when that became clear, even though it was a rare phenomenon, it was a real phenomenon of that vaccine. And eventually then the CDC expressed a preference for the mRNA vaccines. And people see that and they get angry. 
they think, hey, how come you didn't know that before? Because you never know things like that before because you only learn as you go. I mean, Maurice Hilleman, who I consider to be the father of modern vaccines since he was responsible for nine of the 14 vaccines that we currently give to infants and young children, said it best, quote, I never be the sigh of relief until the first three million doses are out there. So you're only going to learn so much in pre-licensure trial and pre-approval trials. But I think the public does not accept that. They want to believe you know everything right away, and when you and when you find out something, they think, "See, you just experimented on our children or on our ourselves." I know my daughter in law got the uh, Johnson and Johnson vaccine, and uh, then listened to all those media reports, and she she was pretty worried that that it wasn't going to be good enough to keep the uh, the COVID away. Well, certainly good enough in terms of protection against serious illness. It wasn't as a single dose vaccine. It wasn't as good at protection against uh, mild illness. But frankly, it, frankly, that is a two dose vaccine, and, and as a two dose vaccine, it compares favorably to the mRNA vaccines, quite favorably. But it does have that rare side effect, which can be um, life limiting. Do you? Uh, is there something down the road that you're? Uh, I mean, the story is being written as we speak, and that's what that's been one of the dramas of it. You know, is watching people learn and watching people change behaviors, watching scientists learn, and and basically watching uh, everybody fly the plane while they're building it. <laughs> I think it's a classic story of that. Is there is there more to the story, Paul? Is there more we're going to be learning in the next uh, year or so? Yeah, well, well, certainly Novavax purified protein vaccine is right around the corner. And, and the more the merrier. I, I think, you know, that we are going to be living with this virus in the world for years, if not decades. You know, we, we give a polio vaccine every year to children in this country. Why? We haven't had a case of polio in this country since the 1970s. We give it because polio still exists in the world, Pakistan, Afghanistan. And, and as long as that's true, as long as this virus is circulating in the world, we are going to need a, ha- to have a highly immune population. And that includes children. And that's the argument that I make actually the most with the parents is your child is going to grow up in a world where this virus still exists. And so better to vaccinate them now to make sure that they're protected, because I I do think protection against serious illness will be relatively long lived. Um, So and I think also so we should have uh, my understanding is that uh, Pfizer should have data on the less than five year old uh, vaccine, certainly within the next month, month and a half. And then we'll see what those data look like. But I think what worries me is people are going to see as the numbers really come down, spring, summer, they're going to think this virus is behind us. And it's not. It's going to be part of our our life for years. And therefore, we're going to need to have a highly protected population for years. And I'm not sure people see it that way. Yeah, As the uh, hospitalization numbers fall and the infection numbers fall, you're right. I, I think people kind of have this idea that they can get back to living the way that they were before. They can throw away the masks and head out to the theaters and head out to the restaurants. And what, what sort of advice would you give people as we head into this next phase of COVID, especially considering we could get another wave of COVID uh, come fall and winter? I, th- I think we can get back to the way we were living before, but but hopefully with our eyes open, you know, that as We'll see what, what the next wave will look like in the winter, uh, and maybe it will be that, that it, it's, it's uh, devastating enough that we want to then go back to wearing masks. But I mean, the, the advice I would give is get vaccinated. I mean, this is the, the nicest thing you can do for yourself or your child to protect yourself. Masks are only so effective, and it's hard to wear masks. And so at the very least, get vaccinated. That's easy enough to do, but people are dug in. It is remarkable that you have people like, say, Kyrie Irving, who who doesn't get vaccinated, therefore he can't play at home in his Brooklyn Nets games, and for which he sacrifices about $17 million. <laughs> I mean, you're only asking him to get two shots. You're not asking him to get a heart transplant. Um, nonetheless, he resists. And, and he scored 26 points the other night. And <laughs> you know, <laughs> Painful. It's, that was a painful game. Yes, it was a really <laughs> painful game. Uh, I will say, Paul, that uh, this uh, half hour began with some good news, which is one of the first times this happened with you on the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the musical inner tube. So it, it's 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 great to uh, have such hopefulness amid the warnings and and you know the uh, uh, the, the things that you're saying about you know uh, what's coming up. Uh, obviously, the, the focus will be on us and the way we feel about things uh, come the fall. Yeah, although you should keep in mind that I'm a Philadelphia Eagles season ticket holder, so my optimism should be <laughs> the pain. The pain is not <laughs> over. <laughs> yeah, not, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, baseball's back. Let's see if the Phillies can do something. Really? Yes. <laughs> that would be good. Well, so thank you, Paul Offit. It's been, once again, a wonderful uh, half hour with you. And uh, and thanks for coming on the Musical Inner Tube. My pleasure. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to the Musical Intertube. You can get in touch with us by email. We're at musicalintertube, all one word, at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at minertube. Capitalize the M and I. Our webpage is musicalintertube. That's musical spelled with two A's. Dot Libsyn, that's spelled L-I-B-S-Y-N, dot com. The Inner Tube is available on Amazon Music, Audible, Facebook, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio Podcasts, and anywhere that you get your podcasts. Like us and give us a good review on any of those platforms. And as always, thanks to Virtual Band Car Radio Dog for our theme music. Music.